Well, good morning. This isn't how we thought we'd be doing church today, but it is. This is our new reality for the next several weeks. We um, have a torn up church. Uh, all of the flooring is torn out. All of the furniture is, uh, most all of the furniture is stacked in the fellowship hall. Um, we have no ability to do anything there right now, so no meetings, nothing that has ever, that's been scheduled the church can go on because we don't have a place to do anything. Everything's torn up and it's being repaired. Uh, there are uh, fans blowing, there's uh, humidifiers that just got brought in. There's a lot of things happening to reduce the humidity and the moisture that's in the walls and the floor uh, so that we can start repairing and get our church back to, again, it'll be a new normal. It won't go back to exactly how it was. It'll be a new normal for us. But uh, wasn't something we planned, but it happened. And so we're just going to catch it in stride and keep moving. And uh, this will be our medium, uh, not what we're doing right now. This is just because this kind of caught us off guard for this week. And next week we're going to do a better job of getting everything set up uh, uh, just for uh, a, a way to record uh, the morning service and get everything uh, with you. But again, for several weeks, we'll meet via, via live stream and uh, not be able to meet in person. So that'll be a part of our experience. So uh, grin and bear it. It'll, it'll be okay. We'll get through this together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you know the beginning and the end and all the details in between. So this issue didn't surprise you. You were already prepared and ready to, to help us get through this, and you've already gotten all the resources lined up. Father, you took care of it, and you're still taking care of it. So we thank you for what you're doing uh, when we go through uh, these unexpected times. Father, just uh, guide us, keep us strong, keep us financially strong as the people keep giving and supporting. Help us to be able to manage all of the details of uh, this issue of a, of a, a flooded church and uh, allow us to get through it together. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry, I did this a minute ago and got choked up and I had to redo the whole thing. So let's try it again. I may be doing that uh, more times than not during this message. Did you know that when they're making a movie, there are times that they will film an alternative ending. And then they'll play that alternative ending for a test audience to see which ones they like the best. And then that will determine how the movie's going to end. Wouldn't that be great for life that you don't like how things are turning out? Well, let me see the alternative ending. Let me, let me have a chance to get a, another option to see if there's some other way I want because I don't like this one. Or if life were like reading a novel where everything was already printed out and we were just reading it as we went through and living it in that way. Uh, I know what we'd do. We'd, we'd cheat. We'd read ahead because we couldn't stand not knowing how something's going to turn out, what's going to be the end, how long do we have to go through this. And we think if we had that information, we could deal with stuff better than not. If we had enough information, we would know this is going to last oh just a short amount of time and I'll be okay after it's over. Uh, this is not going to change my life too much or this is going to change my life radically. But having that information, we think, would, would help us get through. But the problem is life is not a movie. Life is not a novel. There's no script. There's no manuscript that tells us how things are going to work out. It's, it's too real. It's fluid. Uh, it, it can change. In a moment, we're going one direction, and then all of a sudden, we're going a different direction. Or we've got one problem that's dropped into our lap, and then in a few minutes, another problem dropped into our lap. We're going to be going through struggles in life that are just simply so unpredictable that we need a solution. We need a handle. We need a way to be able to get through these things. One of my favorite Bible stories is the story of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. You'll need to turn there in your Bible if you would, because I'm going to be reading through that chapter a little bit, and it's going to help us to kind of get an, an idea of, of what Jehoshaphat went through 
and how the Lord worked in his life, same way he's going to work in our lives. So it's good to have somebody who's already tested the waters and he knows uh, what it took to get through that. And so we know what it's going to take to get through the things that we face. So I want you to imagine that you wake up one morning, you're going through your normal routine, everything is happening just like clockwork, and then middle of the day, somebody comes in and says, oh, Jehoshaphat, there is a army coming in, and they're coming in strong, and they're coming in mighty. There's too many of them for us. They're going to destroy us. Or maybe you wake up, and you go through your morning routine and you've had your breakfast and everything is normal and then you get a text that says church is flooded or maybe the doctor calls and says you know your test results they're just not good you you need to come see me or maybe there's been an accident or maybe someone fell or or maybe somebody died uh, we never know but in an instant everything can change and we can go from absolutely normal, regular, uneventful, to the bottom falling out of life. Well, that, that was Jehoshaphat's day, and that's what was going on with him in this story. So let's see how he handled that, and we'll learn from him how to handle it in our lives. So open up Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Menuhites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then someone came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. So they've come across the Dead Sea. They're in the, the, the little oasis area of En Gedi, and they're staging themselves before they come in and, uh, and, and take over Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat was afraid turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Now that's going to be the theme that we're going to find out as it goes through this story. That's going to come back in again at the very end. And that is the first thing that we do whenever we find ourselves in circumstances that we would consider uh, out of the ordinary, uh, unexpected, and unanticipated, we need to pray. And prayer becomes our very first response to that. Verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord the, before the new court, and he said, Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O oh our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they've lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or the judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Well, there's several things that Jehoshaphat says in his prayer. The first thing is he's declaring, Lord, you're the only one. You're, we're talking to the right God. You're the one who can handle these things. Power and might are in your hand. No one can stand against you. And look at what you've done. You've done these things. And I think a prayer like that is just simply a reminder to us who it is we're praying to. And that in itself can give us courage to ask for what we need in a moment like this. Now, one of the things that came through on that was a reflection from that original temple that Solomon built. In that dedication moment, uh, Solomon had prayed, and the Lord had agreed that if the people, my people, would pray toward this place or in this place or somewhere in focus of this place, I would hear them. Now, we don't have a temple. In fact, we don't even have a church right now that, that we can go into and use. So how do we pray? Well, uh, fortunately, Paul tells us that we are the temple 
of the Spirit of God, that he dwells in us. He is in our bodies so that wherever we are, we're at church, and we can stop and pause right there and pray. And the guarantee is that if we pray to God in any moment, he'll hear us and he'll respond to the things that are going on in our lives. Now he goes on and tells God what God already knows, uh, that the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them, did not destroy them. See how they're rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you've given as an inheritance. Oh, oh God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You know, I think that's an important step in, in praying over difficult times, uh, is to acknowledge how helpless we are. We can't do anything about it. Those that are dealing with cancer know they can't stop it. They can't do anything to make it go away. The doctors are even struggling with how to do that in some cases. Or we've had some who've had COVID and they couldn't stop it. They just had to outlive it. And some were not able to do so. Uh, we're helpless in situations like this. And declaring ourselves helpless is not a bad thing. It is simply putting the perspective where it needs to be. We are helpless, but we are not hopeless. And that's what uh, Je uh, Jehoshaphat was saying there. We're, we're powerless before this great multitude, but we're going to look to you because we know you are not powerless. You are our hope. You are our help. And so in our situations, we look and say, you know, I can't fix this. Can't do anything about it, but God, I simply give you my problem, and I'm going to rely on you to get me through this. Verse 13, and all Judah was standing before the Lord, their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and you can read about all of his uh, family credentials. Verse 15, and he said, listen, all Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go out against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. Do you know that do not be afraid, don't fear, don't be anxious, don't worry, is in your Bible more than almost any other subject? Because God is trying to tell his people, look, trust me. If we trust him, we don't have room for fear or worry or anxiety. They don't go together. You can't have both in the same container. So it ends up that if we're going to trust the Lord, we have to set aside our fear, our anxiety, and our worry. So the very first thing that this man came up and spoke to them from the Lord was, hey, don't be afraid. God's got this. God can handle this. Now, for us today, we, we know that God has given us his word, primarily in his scripture. He, is, he has gone through all of these uh, ages of having his writers write down the words that he wants us to have. And we read through them, and then all of a sudden, a verse, maybe a, a chapter, maybe a section, something, just simply the light comes on. And we realize, whoa, God is speaking to me right now in that verse. It, it takes a very personal turn. It all of a sudden becomes our message from God. Like this Jehaziel walking into the room and saying, hey, let me tell you what God wants you to hear. Well, we find that in Scripture. We'll read that, and that verse may be what we're to cling to to get through whatever we're facing. That verse becomes our source of encouragement, our hope, 
our sense of fulfillment of what God intends for us, but it's what we hang on to because this is what God has said, so this is how I'm going to go through this unpredictable moment in some very strong way. Uh, verse 14, no, I'm sorry, let me get down to where we are. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Israel of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites, the sons of Kohathites, and the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise God of Israel with a very loud voice. You know that praise should be the response of hearing from God. Uh, we're, we, we know that often we think uh, worship is us saying something to God, but worship ought to be our response to hearing from God. Uh, many times I think we get things backwards a little bit. We, we put the song part, the, the music part of, of worship before the message. Um, it, it very well could be that that ought to come after, uh, that we have heard from the Lord. Now let's worship the Lord and let our worship be in, in, in keeping with what he's just told us. Well, they have heard from the Lord, and so that's be, become their message of how they're going to focus on him. Well, see, one of the great issues here is, is the fact that we can be helpless, but again, we are never hopeless. A child of God is never hopeless, and that's the message that's getting embedded in this, regardless of how things look, regardless of how it sounds coming from the outside. That's not the final answer. The final answer is what has God said? What's been the word from the Lord? What's the insight of what God intends to do? Now that may come in, in a moment like that. Peace may come when we hear the word. We, we have read a scripture and God says, this is for you. Carry this with you as you go through this experience. And so having that word, it's as though the, the burden is lifted off of us. That burden lifting may, may come uh, just from the sense that God decided instead of us carrying the burden, give that burden to him, and he will instead give us peace. So sometimes we, we, we are able to have that experience uh, not from what we have found God has said to us in this moment, but of what we know about God. God is the God who wants to carry our burdens. And so we remember in that moment, I, I got to give this to God. I've got to give my burden to him. And we give that burden to him. He gives us his peace in an exchange for that. There was a contest years ago by some painters who were told to paint a scene using one word as your theme. And the word was peace. And so several of the Paintings came back, as you would expect, a pastoral setting of a hillside with cows uh, roaming around on it, or, or maybe a sunset, or maybe a lake wakening up in the morning, um, and, and, and you, you, felt, you felt peace in that. Uh, one, one, auth one painter uh, took a different approach. He, he painted a, a tree with a limb hanging out over a big precipice. And on that limb, there was a bird nest, and in that bird nest, there were baby birds. And then there was a mother bird who had covered that nest with herself, with her wings out over that. And then you looked out in the distance, and you saw this black, ominous cloud coming in, and you knew it was coming that direction. It had lightning fragments going across it, and you saw the storm was coming. But then you took back and looked at that little bird that little bird was at peace. The storm didn't matter. The storm wasn't going to shake the bird's confidence. The bird stayed there through the storm, and that was peace, being able to manage when the storm is coming. That's what prayer is supposed to do for us. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, two things that Paul sort of gave us uh, extra visual with. Uh, the last, the, the, the peace will guard 
our hearts and our minds. The word guard is their garrison. It's a military term of a building a, a fortress around us and, and protecting us from anything coming from the outside. And, and he did that in, in two different directions. There's the heart, and in this particular instance, the heart is a reference to our emotions. It's where we feel the, 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 the fear, the, the worry, and the anxiety. Uh, we, we have those tightenings in our chest that we just can't deal with this. Well, Paul said, no, God's going to come in and give you peace, and it's going to build a garrison, a fortress around your heart. Uh, to keep those feelings from just overwhelming you. And then it's going to affect our minds. And the minds basically, again, being the source of our attitudes and actions, um, our response to what's going on. Paul says we're going to come in and build a fortress around that so that you can relax your attitudes. You can relax your actions. Just go with the flow of this. Uh, allow what's going on to happen. Uh, and, and trust the Lord with the outcome. It, it's not the burden you have to carry. You've given that to him. So allow the process to work through. And when it comes to the fact this is not our battle, when, when God fights our battles for us, several things happen. Number one, miracles. You've heard stories. You know the stories of people who have experienced a miracle, whether that's been a healing or, or an immediate answer to prayer or whatever they prayed specifically just happened. Uh, there, there's so many ways that God will work a miracle, but when we're trusting in him to be the one fighting the battle on our behalf, he's free to do his miraculous work. Also, uh, when God fights our battles, we get results that we could not have gotten on our own. There are things that God will do that we never could have worked out. We could not have made this happen or fixed this problem. Uh, also, solutions come that defy explanation. Uh, burden is lifted off of us. We're, we've, we've carried this worry, anxiety, and fear, and all of a sudden it's gone. Uh, and, and, and we didn't quit. We simply asked God, to enter into our problem, and the burden was lifted off of us. And then we also discover God doesn't need our help. Uh, God is doing what God only can do, and will get us through that. So when he says that, he's basically um, being who he is. His, his character is wrapped up in his name. And throughout Scripture, you'll hear different names for God that are attached to a person's situation what he is to them in that moment or what they need him to be in that moment. And they will call him by those different names. And you've, you've heard uh, many of them. You've, you've heard God Almighty. Uh, I need an almighty God who is bigger than all of these things that I face. Uh, one is God, my supplier. Uh, I don't have the resources. So God, I trust you to be my supplier. The God who sees God, I'm lonely. I'm sitting here by myself. Do you even see me? Do, do you know I'm here? Or the God who hears, uh, the God who is listening to me as I pray. God, my healer. I need him to be my healer. Well, that's who he is. And by who he is, that's what he does. Uh, the God who is there, the God who is peace, the God who is everlasting. Uh, different ways that, that the name of God has been attached to something God was doing or something the people needed him to do, and they recognized him that way. There was a, a, a statement that Peter wrote for us. He said, cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. Now, he wasn't giving us a name necessarily, but by the actions of God, we could realize there is something of God's character in what Peter told us God would do. We could cast on him because he cared for us. So we could basically call him the God who cares. Um, and, and that's important to know. If, if he is the God who cares, if I have a care, if I have a burden, if I have a concern, and I want to give that to God, I, I, I don't just toss it and hope that he catches it. By his character of who he is in Scripture, he will do so because he is the God 
who cares? And he is going to be able to take that and work me through. If I'm, if I'm uh, noticing that who he is, is is what he does, he is the expression of all of these things, I also have to understand that none of this ever changes. Uh, it, this wasn't how God was in the Old Testament, how God was in the, in the first century. Uh, it's how God is at all times. So if I read a story where there is some indication that God fought the battle for another people and they didn't have to do anything but stand there and trust God, then that can happen in my life as well. That can be as real right now because time and circumstances don't change anything about God. It remains the same. Now, look at, look at verse uh, 20. They rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and they went out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Ju Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. Now, the last part of that, put your trust in the prophets, is put your trust in the word of God. Because that was the role of the prophet, to basically speak in God's behalf. They didn't have it all written out as we do. So for us, that would translate into trust what God has said in his word. Trust what God has said. But the first part of that is that we are to put our trust in God and our lives will be established. In other words, you've got faith. Use it. That's the time you use faith is when the circumstances become unexpected and uh, 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 sometimes uh, disastrous or sometimes they create crisis. That's a time that God has designed faith for. We, we can trust him in times like that. Uh, Solomon wrote, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your way, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Someone says, well, why are my paths so disjointed and going in so many different directions? Maybe you're not acknowledging him. Maybe, maybe you've not done your part of acknowledging, trusting in him, not leaning on your understanding, and then he would do his part of directing our paths, making our paths straight. So you remember the story when Jesus was on the boat with his disciples, storm, raging, and they woke him up and basically said, we're drowning here. And Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves and said, stop. And they did. And then Jesus asked them a very, very pertinent question. He said, where's your faith? Where's your ability to trust? Where, where is that connection that you can make with problem to solution? Is it not operational in your life. You see, we keep our focus on what God is saying, not what the circumstances are saying. Let's read a little bit more. Uh, verse 21. Then when he had consulted with the people and had appointed those who sang to the Lord, they praised him in holy attire, went before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord. His loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set the ambushes and did all the things that he did. You see, we, we don't understand how God is going to work out the details. That's not our part. We're, we're not telling God what he has to do to solve our problems. We're simply saying, God, we got a problem, and we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. We're looking to you for our help. So help we give it to you. We trust in you. We're going to rely on you. And so we don't always get to find out why this happened, um, what, what caused this, what brought it about. All we're probably going to recognize is what did God do to take us through it and accomplish the thing. So just accept the peace. Accept the peace that God gives us. I uh, heard when we were talking uh, in the midst of all the, the water crisis at the church, I heard that statement that I really um, object to, uh, that this being an act 
of God. Um, it sounds like God targets uh, us for evil. Um, that's Greek mythology. It goes back to Greek mythology of the gods sitting up on Mount Olympus and zapping the people and, and wreaking havoc on their lives just simply because they can. And, and we sort of think that God would indiscriminately bring crisis into our lives and, and hurt us. Um, I don't see that unless, unless God is using circumstances like that to get our attention. Maybe, maybe we need to deal with some area. Maybe we need to change something in our life. Or maybe we have sin and we need to repent. And so God will shake up our circumstances to, to get our attention. And so that goes back to the fact of what all of this started in the beginning. God, we're, we got a problem here. We don't know what to do. So we're going to look to you. And in looking to God, God has room then to do things in our lives he may need to do while he works out the details of all of the things that have been going on. You know, I don't, I don't know why the church flooded. I understand the physical aspect of it, mechanically, what happened, uh, where the water came from. I understand all of that. But the why, why our church, why we had to go through that, I don't really understand. Let me give you the scenario. I got a, a, a call, text at 817 Wednesday morning that said, it looks like we have water in the foyer. I called Leon Hudman and said, Leon, can you get to the church and turn the water off? And I'm on my way. And so I got there a little after 830. And uh, at that time, I walked in two inches of water in the foyer uh, waded in through that and then began to look at the scope of all that had happened. Well, right around that time, uh, Cindy and Emily uh, sent out a plea for help to our church and then to the community, and uh, people started coming in. We had, by 9.30, we had a house full of people squeegeeing, washing, pushing the water out, uh, and then vacuuming up into to wet backs, pulling up carpet, uh, lifting up furniture, putting it on blocks for now, and then lifting up the pews to get them out of the water. Uh, we had a well-orchestrated team with no instructions. Basically, everyone came with a desire to help. They found an implement of help, and they took off and began to do that. We had people from our church. We had people from the community. Some I knew, some I didn't know, but we had a house full of people that, that was helping us in all of these matters. Uh, Greg Lukenbaum uh, and Kit Marie began to, to manage the, the, the things and aspect of our um, uh, risk management, of our insurance, of our positioning of how we're gonna work through these things. And uh, they had gotten everything into action. And then in just a, a short time, a man from the neighborhood walked in who happened to own a remediation company. That means a company that helps dry out buildings that are flooded, uh, get them uh, ready for re reconstruction, the things that have to be done, but it's a very essential step in the process. Well, this man came in uh, because he saw the notice and just wanted to come by and see what we were doing. Well, he owned a remediation company, and by the afternoon, after we had contacted uh, several different services to say, hey, we, we've got a problem, come help. And they said, well, we can't be there for another week or so. That afternoon, we had a contract with this company. And the very next day, Thursday, their equipment was coming in and they started the process. That was the Lord taking care of us. Uh, even before we had a problem, he had an answer. And everything was just clicking off in a sequence of what he was doing. Uh, early on, when, uh, when the, we were first, people first getting there and we were all sloshing around in water, um, it, it looked pretty overwhelming. Uh, how do we get this water out? What do we do? How do we take care of this moment? It seemed to be a bigger problem than we could handle, quite honestly. Kit Marie said, you know, we need to pray. And so we stopped, got everybody together and prayed. 
From then on, the Lord just started clicking answers one after another from people who had the right equipment to come in, from people who had good solutions. Um, it was very slippery in there, and only uh, a couple of people fell down. Most everybody else made it through without uh, getting, getting scathed in any way at all. And everything that we had um, just simply started coming together uh, in, in a way that you just have to say, that's God. Some of the men were, were gathered around before they left that day and talking about how everything, this, this was too easy. It was just happening, and everything was happening, and and, and uh, they just said it's, it's amazing what God did. <laughs> and Johnny Borden said, "You know, um, the amazing thing is that we're amazed that God did this because that's what our God does. Our amazing God does amazing things for us." Now, sure, we're going to be down for the next several weeks uh, until everything gets back to our new normal. Uh, but the God who began this work in us is going to get us through it. Uh, there's, there's not a concern. There's not a worry. Uh, the pianos have been taken away into dry storage. They're going to be okay. Uh, everything else is going to work when we get back. But it's, it's all being worked according uh, to God's purposes. He'll see us through to completion because that's what kind of God he is, uh, the God who accomplishes his purposes in our behalf, uh, the God that takes care of, our chil of, of his children. Now, what he did for Jehoshaphat was not exceptional uh, to us. It was just uh, beyond anything we could imagine happening. But for God, that was just a matter of how he took care of them that day. He's doing the same thing in our life right now and in our church. Whatever we face, whether, whether it's at your home or in our church, God's got it. Bursted pipe, um, ceiling collapsed on the floor, um, ongoing health issues, new diagnosis, uh, a sad prognosis, crisis with your family. He's got a plan to see you through. You don't have to fall apart. You don't have to get fearful, worried, or anxious. Your job is to trust him. His job is to do the work. And that's where we are today. Let me give you three takeaways, and we'll wind this up. When you discover the crisis, first thing you do is pray. Second thing you do is expect. Third thing you do is trust. Pray. Expect God to be God. And trust that he's going to accomplish his purpose in us, through us, and for us. Because that's the kind of God he is. So, let that be an encouragement. Get us focused on the things that we need to, to know what's going on in our church and maybe to know what's going on in our lives because it all applies and it all works together. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share with folks. And we just pray that you might use these words to bring encouragement to the lives of people who perhaps are afraid right now, worried or anxious, or struggling with issues that have just driven them to the end of their rope. Father, give them the courage to keep their eyes on you and let you do in their life what you want to do to demonstrate how much you love them. Thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Just so you know, Oreo was helping me the whole time. All right, God bless. Talk to you later.